Welcome to the Awe and Wonder podcast. I'm Sarah Kinsella. And I'm Brenda Del Monte. And in this series, we're talking about vision and its role in assistive technology and AAC. And today we're joined by Dr. Krista Wilkinson, who is a distinguished professor at Penn State University. And her main interests include vocabulary learning, as well as the use of visual supports in communication and education. We're really excited to have Dr. Wilkinson with us today. Um, she's authored numerous articles about augmentative alternative communication or AAC. And I know I first ran across her name when searching for um, cortical vision impairment, CVI and AAC research. And I think that led me to um, Dr. Wilkinson, your collaboration with the Bridge School, I think maybe through one of the AAC by the Bay conferences where you were a guest um, speaker. And so we're just excited to have you on today and hear about some of your research that you've been doing and your experiences with vision and AAC with students. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Krista, what brings you to the world of AAC or vision? Do you have a personal connection? Not really. Um, I, my kind of, the center of my scholarship is um, supporting communication in individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And um, often those individuals can benefit from AAC. So I came to AAC through my interest in developmental and intellectual disabilities. Um, in terms of vision, that was, vision has been on my radar um, in part because it occurred to me, you know, fairly midway through my career that, um, you know, we have these AAC de devices and some kids or people take off with them, right? They're using them right away. They're using them so effectively. We know AAC is an evidence-based intervention. But then there were some kids who were continuing to struggle. Um, even though we had these evidence-based interventions that worked for other people, they weren't working for everyone. And so that was kind of the section of the community that I was really interested in supporting. And it felt to me like the issue might not necessarily be with our interventions, but rather that there's something we're not understanding about the fit between the intervention and the individual. And so that brought me to the world of vision in 2004. I worked with a visual cognitive neuroscience test to really identify, like, what do we know about human visual processing and how might that apply to how we're setting up our AAC devices? Um, and I think it kind of came as a surprise to me as I was moving along with this program of research that we hadn't actually been wondering about vision before. This is in general, not cortical visual impairment. So I began to really make the argument that in speech and language, we require that our undergraduates or our graduate students take um, classes where they learn about audiology and they learn about the auditory signal, even though they're not becoming audiologists themselves. And presumably that's because uh, we understand that creating an optimal oral language intervention requires us to understand something about how the child is hearing or hearing sounds. And yet we hadn't applied that same logic to AAC, much of which is using a visual medium. And so I, I really got interested in how can we better understand how people are processing AAC displays in order to make those AACs a better fit for their visual processing capabilities. So that's kind of how I came to um, this idea of vision and AAC together. If, it, if vision is the modality that people are accessing their AAC, then that AAC needs to be set up in ways that are compatible with human visual processing in general and with the visual processing of people with intellectual disabilities in particular. Wow, that's such a great point that um, we do learn about audiology and and it, yeah, there is such a need for pre-service students to learn about AAC and that visual modality, that makes sense. You know, I have done communication device evaluations on students who are deaf and or who's um who are hearing but their parents are deaf right so you're looking at like how do, so how is the device helping their, that communication piece and how what kind of visual feedback are we giving them either one wh whoever's non-hearing um the visual feedback to know that the device was activated and things like that right but i don't but sometimes 
if, if a student is deaf, then we don't get a referral for them. It's, it's like, but the, but they don't have the motor skills for sign la sign language, right? Like their their CP or their their diagnosis doesn't allow for. It's like, well, if they can't hear and they can't use their hands for sign language, then we need we do need the other, right? So it's like there's a few there's a small population that kind of doesn't get referred because they don't even realize the capacity, right? And I think we see the same thing with vision. We get, we, some kids are under referred because they're low vision. They probably can't do AAC. And it's like, wait a minute, just because they have low vision doesn't mean they don't have a need to communicate or they can't communicate. And if you were to take a typical blind person, meaning physically typical, cognitively typical, and they're blind, of course they're communicating. So it's like at some point in the, um, in the diagnosis, right? We decide, oh, there's too many things. Forget the AAC stuff, right? Or they're not a candidate or something. Right. And we and we blame the child and what we perceive as that child's limitations rather than saying, what can this child do? And how can our AAC support that? And that actually is really kind of my avenue into the work with CBI was really this, because I had to been doing all of my work up until I went to the bridge school, um, which was just before COVID, but I'd been working with them a little bit before that. I had been doing all of my work with folks with Down syndrome, autism, intellectual disabilities of other origins. And some of what I was doing with that work probably does translate to CBI. But I think there's a lot that's very specific and special to folks who have CBI. And so we should not either try and force this, you know, force our mainstream AAC technologies onto them, because that's not going to work. That's goes back to my, there's some kids who don't adopt it and maybe it's because it's not a good fit. Mm -hmm. But I also don't think we should give up on them just because we don't understand how to set up an AAC that accommodates um, the not only the current visual processing skills of that child, but where that child might be in the future because we know that with CBI, we can see improvement in vision. And our AAC should be a part of that, helping that happen. Yeah, And I think it's a great way to think about it. It's like, instead of saying, well, they're, due to their limitations, they're not a candidate. It's more like due to my limitations of understanding, I don't know how to help you. So let's figure this out. Right. Awesome. It's really on us to, to dig deeper. Right. And we, to do that, we have to understand how people with cortical visual impairment are interacting with the world visually. And that's part of kind of, that's how the bridge school got me out there was, was this idea that we need to understand something about these kids and their visual processing in order to optimize their AAC. So what are some of those things that we need to understand? So I have to say that of the people you've interviewed, I may be the newest to CVI. Um, so, I first went out um, to the Bridge School literally in end of February, right before COVID took over the country, um, to do some of the work that I've done with these other uh, individuals um, to see if we could learn something about visual processing patterns in children who had different, who were scoring at different levels on the CBI scale, uh, CBI range by Dr. Roman Lancy. And um, so we, I took my eye tracking equipment out there and I and I did um, some research um, and then COVID hit. And so we switched it to a Zoom based format and we collected the gaze data actually using Zoom, which is surprisingly good at um, seeing where the eyes are on the screen. You, if you're just looking like left to right, you can do that with fair amount of integrity. Hmm. So um, what we learned was that just as would be predicted by what Dr. Roman Lancy had been hypothesizing all along is that the the gaze patterns of people who are early, on the earlier uh, stages of the range were different from and predictable by their score on later uh, areas on the range. So we had uh, someone who was right in between um, phase two and phase three, which is able to kind of deal with slightly more complex items and starting to look at um, meaningful parts like the face rather than the ear, right? So, and it was particularly interesting. We had one stimulus, it was from the CBI range, it was a teddy bear. And they had, it, the teddy bear had very bright foot pads and then was holding a, a bottle that had a yellow cap. So red foot pads uh, cap and had a face with a little smile on it. And this young woman was focused on the face, 
which was predicted by where she was on the range, that she was emerging into that part of the range. So we really were able to take a look at some of the things that Dr. Roman Lancey had suggested from a clinical standpoint are important parts of um, visual functioning. We were able to confirm that in, in as small of a way as we did. It was all preliminary in part because of COVID. Um, so as a result of that visit, I ended up on uh, the advisory board to the Bridge School um, with Lynn Elko, who I know you interviewed earlier. Um, and everything, when Lynn was describing, this would have been fall, spring of 2021, I think she was describing, so sorry, what I had looked at in my research was complexity, because we know visual complexity can be a really important early, early um, thing that can be hard for people at the early range levels, but then they move along. Can you explain what that means, visual complexity? So, so, comple so it turns out complexity for people with CVI involves two things. One is if you simply look at the number of items on a display, so that's going to be the, dis the number, if you have 12 items on a display, that's more complex than if you only have two items on a display. And what we found um, with regards to that was that uh, some people could really do very well when there was just one item presented, but if there was two items presented, their visual uh, behavior kind of fell apart. So number of items is one. And then also the number, the, the complexity within an item. So um, if you have uh, a, play, a, a scene of a playground and there's just a slide as compared to a scene of a playground and there's a slide and a ball. So that's internal complexity. So you've got the complexity of, of that integrated scene and then how many integrated scenes are present at a time. It could be done also with symbols. Like we talk about complexity, the AC symbols in terms of number of keystrokes, that would be internal complexity. And then the complexity across that, if you're talking about picture symbols would be how many picture symbols altogether are there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks for clarifying. And what we found was, sure, what we found was that, again, in aligning with the CVI range, the people at the lower, who are still in the lower or the earlier stages um, of the range, could had very good, very systematic gaze behavior when they were looking at something that just had one item in the scene. But as soon as we added five or or 15 items, again, their gaze behavior started to become less well regulated. Whereas the people who had whose functional vision had progressed were able to handle those more complex scenes. So, um, so that told us a lot about complexity. That was where we started. So I'm on this advisory board with Lynn, and she's describing her journey with her daughter Emma um, towards an AAC system that worked and was responsive to her CVI. And I'm listening to Lynn, and I'm like, everything you're saying has not everything she was saying, because she actually had a lot of great ideas that hadn't been researched yet. But what she was saying that she said, no, this worked and this other thing didn't work, was completely in line with the research that mm. we had. So we know. So she was doing all of this evidence-based work with her daughter. And I was like, we have all this evidence base that's not yet connected to you know, actual clinical outcomes. And so I proposed after listening to her, I said, Lynn, we need to write a paper where we describe the research and then we describe how what you did when it was consistent with that research transformed them as AAC experience. Um, so that's what led to the paper. Um, that's where I did most of my learning was in our my conversations with the team um, that wrote that paper was learning about the kinds of things that um, Emma was doing. So can I just keep yeah, going? That's great. And so that paper that you're referencing is available for those who um, are ASHA members, you might have seen it come up recently through ASHA. It's um, it's a, and it's actually open access, so you don't have to be an oh, ASHA right. member in order to be able to download it. So um, okay. I highly encourage people who aren't ASHA members to download it too. Mm -hmm. Great. So an open access article, an evidence-based approach to augmentative and alternative communication design for individuals with cortical visual impairment. And I'd love to have you continue with talking about that. Um, one thing that's so nice about this type of research that you two are, that you are doing is that it connects to that student. It connects to Emma. And um, it's always so nice to, number one, bring it back to the a student, but have an example of, uh, and that we can kind of look to and help to make it a little more concrete. 
I also love that you said, and that's where I did most of my learning because that's how I feel. I mean, I did most, I do most of my learning by actually listening to the parents and what they're observing. They did, they may not have done the research on all the things, but they certainly have done the research on their child and they're watching what they're observing and they're watching when she's shutting down and they're watching what she's doing and, and they are pretty sure would they know what she wants and they're trying to figure out why does, why does reaching for that thing mean this thing when those don't seem connected to us? Is it, you know, and so just the observations of parents who are living this life, they are witnessing this. And then it's so beautiful, right? When what they're witnessing is actually lining up with the research. And it's not even that what they were doing was matching the research, but also the research is matching what they were doing. So yes. that's one of the reasons in the paper, we, we start by talking about the three pillars of evidence-based practice research and scholarship, clinical expertise, but then the client perspectives. And the client perspective is almost never, except for now in some of the um, participatory research that we're seeing in coming out of largely uh, people who work with folks with autism, but we need those voices to be directly integrated into um, what we're doing and why we're doing it. So I, I think I really love, we, we, it's unusual to have someone with multiple disabilities be an author on a scholarly paper like this. And I approached the editor of the journal and I said, we're pretty strongly committed to Emma being an author on it, even though, you know, she's not reporting verbally for herself. And it was for exactly the reason you, that you just said, which is that it's clear if Emma, like if one time Lynn put five symbols on her display and Emma stopped using it. So she dropped back down to two and Emma started using it again. Emma is communicating quite clearly. Um, and it's it's the fact that she's got a mother like Lynn who's interpreting that, that we know Emma's opinions. Emma's opinions are in there and informed everything that we did in that paper. That's wonderful. Um, some of the things that Emma is doing have really not received a ton of research. Uh, John McCarthy has done some, a little bit of on, on this, but not really not a ton. One of the challenges that, um, going back to my complexity thing of how many items can be on the board, you know, we really want to have robust, this is actually a discussion that Lynn and I had, we really want to have a robust vocabulary so that the child or the individual has access to lots and lots of symbols. And the way we accomplish this typically, is we squeeze a lot of symbols onto a single page. So you have a 64 or 62 symbol grid. Um, that's not going to work necessarily, at least in the short term, for a lot of people who have CVI. Um, so how do we build a robust vocabulary when you only can have two items on a board? Or let's even say five items on a board particularly when one of those items has to be a navigation key, right? So we have to navigate back to the main menu if we want to move from page to page. So now we're down to four content symbols, um, if we can only have five from a standpoint of visual processing on the display. Well, Emma and Lynn came up with the genius solution. Um, she swipes. So her pages are interlinked. She can swipe really quickly. There's no need for, a they do have a navigation key, but there's no need to take content space for navigation because navigation is done using the swipe function. This is brilliant. It is not used by most AAC manufacturers or a, and even if it's the capability is there, it's not in the manuals <laughs> that, oh, you could use swipe. So I think there are things that, were that I learned from Lynn and, and Emma about, you know, how do we design this? Well, we can design, if we use swipe, if the person is capable of doing swipe, or if we can have some other form, some other touchscreen gesture. And I can talk a little bit about my work with someone from information sciences and technology on using AI to improve our AAC services. Uh, but that's just a really great example of something they're doing that could be so impactful for other people if we could just get the technology to be more flexible. Yes, and I love that you said, you know, that it may not work right now for that student, right? Because what we know is about all students, but certainly with CBI that it changes and that some layouts may work now, some may work later. And um, whatever we have doesn't mean it's going to be that way for an AE system for the rest of their life. And we certainly saw that talking to Lynn and then also if you are able to look at that in the article or at her website, you know, you can see some of the progression of different things they've tried. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Tell us about that AI piece. Yeah, so it was, the AI piece was all um, inspired by Lynn and Emma's uh, story, really. So um, 
I had we had I had learned about the swiping. I had seen Emma swiping and finding things. She's really very fast. And um, simultaneously, I made a. I was invited by a colleague in information sciences and technology to give a talk about AAC uh, design to a class that he was running on um, accessible computing. So accessible and computing a little bit more broadly. Um, and but his particular area is people with low vision or blindness. Um, so I came and I talked to this class and um, and he then invited me to kind of talk about our shared interests. He has this system for people who are blind and low vision to access. People who are blind or low vision have trouble accessing with a mouse because they can't see where the mouse necessarily see where the mouse is, is on the screen. So a lot of their access is directly through keyboard, which means a lot of keystrokes. Um, and it's time consuming and screen readers don't necessarily aren't all that functional. They will read the screen, but like if you're on an Excel spreadsheet, it'll go through file and then edit. And then, you know, it'll read all the way through before it gets to. So he developed this access system that used um, fingers, movements, kind of like uh, if you, if you use, I'm not going to explain this as well as he would, but basically there's a reference point at the wrist. And then you have, I think there's 29 points in the finger where movement can happen. And so if I have my thumb out, it means one thing. If I have my finger up, it means another thing. If I have my thumb and my finger up, it means a third thing. And so you can map essentially meaning onto these gestures, not sign language, but onto these gestures. And if you think about those old flip, one of the ways that this can be used, if you think about those old flip phones, when you had number one was A, B, and C, and number two was D, E, and F, it's mm -hmm. basically that kind of a process. And I'm like, the computer can, you know, can detect with enough accuracy this. He's like, oh, yeah, sure. I'm like, well, could the computer detect something like I do this and it means one thing, but I do this and it means something else? Oh, yeah, sure. So um, yeah. is that using a neuro node or what's on the wrist? So you can do a number of different things. He's actually doing it just using the screen camera. So it's the screen camera that's detecting oh. these where we have gone, so we we wrote a grant to say, so in AAC, we make this distinction between aided AAC that involves, you know, hitting, you know, with your finger or hitting a switch with your head and unaided AAC, which is the body-based gestures that are typically faster to make. They're well within the person's existing repertoire because the person's doing them already. Um, but the drawback is nobody, if you're not familiar with that individual, you may not know what that, right. Means. Emma does this for one, right? And if you don't know Emma, you're not going to necessarily know that that's what she means. And you're, she and you're waving out. your hand like you're about, like oh, you're yeah. bouncing a basketball, right? For, for If you're listening to this podcast and not seeing her, she's putting her hand out and, and waving her hand like she's bouncing a basketball. And that's meaning I want. Yes. So that's very uh, idiosyncratic, right? It's very unique to her. Exactly. Right. So... So it's good because it's fast and it's if it's not effortful, but it's bad because somebody who doesn't know is not going to be able to interpret it. Whereas right. the aided AAC, it's slow and it's often effortful if you're particularly if you're making repetitive movements, but other people can understand because of the speech output. So Syed is my colleague and Don Sowers and I wrote these grants to say we would like to develop software that could interpret natural air gestures, which would be like, I move my my fist from left to right across my face, or I move my fist from right to left across my face. And those are two different messages. Um, we could use uh, a sensor-based. So that's actually where we started. So we put a sensor on the wrist and the sensor sends speed and location and coordinate um, to a dedicated smartphone, which then records those data. Um, and uh, and then touchscreen gesture. So we have all three of those are going to be things that we're working on programming for. We started with the sensors. We have a um, a team that includes Lynn and two uh, uh, and two other people who have uh, themselves have cerebral palsy, plus myself. Um, Sharon is actually part of the group, and um, Don Sowers and Syed. And we asked our community advisors of these three things, right? Computer computer based interpretation of gestures, um, touch screen interpretation of like swipe and other touch screen gestures, or sensor based um, 
uh, interpretation of gestures. And the community advisors were, as, as a one, wanted to start with the sensor-based. Um, and the reason for that, which is, was of course the hardest one to start with because you had to get all the sensor up and running. But the reason for that was because it would allow communication when the device, right now the AAC device has to kind of be right there, right? So if you're in the water, for instance, you're not, you don't have your high-tech AAC device typically in the water with you. So one of our community advisors has adapted water skiing and he's envisioning having the sensor in on his wrist that's communicating with the smartphone on the boat that he can communicate now in a way that he can't uh, while he's, so this idea of being able to do, it's not remote, but being able to do communication when the technology is not directly next to you mm -hmm. was why they felt it was such a, a valuable place to start. Wow. Fascinating. Yeah. And yeah, so the this sky is the limit now, right? There's just so many options for all of this, but you, but you, but you first have to understand what what is their vision like now, right? What are the starting points here for families? So for yeah, so definitely understanding where their vision is now, and I think there's a number of different sources for that. Obviously, the family is going to be a really important source of information about what they perceive. I think what happens in the home and what happens in school might be slightly different. So obviously ed educational professionals, um, you know, to the extent that we should be promoting interprofessional practices with teachers of the visually impaired. Absolutely. Um, I think that's, that's going to be really important. So I think for, for CBI in particular, we really want that interprofessional um, mm -hmm. approach and whether that interprofessional, I mean, ideally everybody's going to do something like the CBI range, but, even if people who aren't using the CBI range, are, I'm I'm not I'm new to this, but you know I know that there are people who are expert in understanding how someone's vision is functioning. And I think SLPs, I give that I give a CBI lecture in my class now, and nobody's thought about vision, and now they're like, oh, I can see why I would need this, even for my students who don't have CBI. Like it's going to be really important to know, like what are they do? Can they see that blackboard? Are they interacting with that blackboard? Mm -hmm. Folks with Down syndrome who have trouble with accommodation. So they're, they, if they're looking at something near and then they try and look at something far, it takes them a little bit longer to focus on, to refocus on that. And we're not really thinking about these things. That is true. And I think something that we hear um, as a common theme throughout this topic of vision and AAC and AT is, is really kind of being a detective and looking at things a little bit closer. Um, I think we actually hear that with several of our topics, you know, kind of listening in, watching, just, it, it seems like um, that's just kind of a, a good step for all of us. And then I love that parent partnership as well. It's so important. They're often the experts. I also think that, you know, SLPs, and I, I'm throwing us under the bus a little bit, but we're not comfortable with not knowing. So permission to go, I don't know what I'm looking at here. And um so I wonder, keep wondering, keep asking, keep broadening the team so that there's more eyes on what, what, what am I observing? What do I still not know? What, are, what's something I can change? You know, some of those real basic questions that we, that we need to ask as scientists. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, I think, again, one of the things that we have experienced as a team, Lynn and Tara and Don and I, um, is and Sarah Blackstone, is this idea people want Emma's materials because Emma's materials are working so well. And it's like, but that's not going to work for your child. So I think, you know, adding to the wonder, I wonder why something that, you know, is evidence based, and, you know, we, we want to use that evidence based practice, wonder why that's not working for this person. And, you know, maybe it's vision or maybe it's attention or maybe it's, you know, the, there's a loud environment. Uh, and that's all the things that we put into this paper. Like we put in, we in the paper, we talk about three different areas that people need to be aware of. One of them is things about the child. You know, does the child get tired at a certain point of the day? Is the child having medication changes? Those kinds of things that we know about the child. Things that we know about the partner, what the partner ought to be doing. So not being overly chatty or making sure that we know about the child, does that child have a visual field cut? Because if they do, let's not put the AAC where the child can't see it, um, that kind of thing. So, and then things that we can do regarding the design, which is kind of where I come in. 
Um, but so we have these these kind of steps that people or areas that people need to keep in mind as they're considering this child, because what worked for some other child isn't going to be necessarily right for this one. And that's where kind of we cycle back to what do we need to know? We need to know these three kinds of things, some things about the child, some things about the partner behavior and some things about the AAC design itself. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned um, the swiping as part of the AAC design um, considerations. What are some other considerations that you mentioned in the article? Yeah, so Emma, as I said earlier, Emma's contributions over the years um, were her mother's observations of what was working and what was not working for her. So um, there's a lot in the article about how, um, you know, she, Lynn would... And a good example, Lynn, um, you know, they would do the AAC on the table and Emma wasn't using it, but they had this low tech key ring that had essentially flashcards of symbols on them. And Emma would, that was the one thing that Emma consistently would use. And what she would do is she would hold it up here because that's where her best vision was. So Emma had learned, she couldn't see what's on the, and it took them so long to realize that she had a visual field cut that was affecting her lower visual field, which is where we put AAC typically on that table or tray. But Emma came up with, oh, well, if I, I can use this because I can see it. So her contributions were really voiced through Lynn's narrative. Mm -hmm. um, but she did do two, we did have, um, the way the article started, it just kind of described a typical interaction of Emma requesting, I think, grapes from um, from Lynn. And then Lynn did an interview, a little interview with her at the Emma at the end about kind of Emma's perceptions about um, her AAC. So she had two direct contributions, but really her contributions were what was working and, and what didn't work and, and how the changes were made. Sure. Um, so yeah. certainly an uh, integral part of. Well, yeah. So all, it's all about her, right? And her experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so in terms of things that um, people kind of need to be, have on their radar, um, skills brought by the individual include physical and emotional well being. You know, people with CBI have good and bad days just like the rest of us. Um, and so we need to know, like, what is impacting uh, the person's in ability to engage or interact their vision. Um, at the time of the assessment, and that can include things like interests, um, time of day, medical status. You know, if you have a stomach ache, you're not going to be as attentive as if you're feeling very healthy that day. Um, you mentioned level of functional visit, vision, uh, visual motor integration. So um, if there's something over here that I'm reaching for, am I looking and reaching for it? Or do I glance over it and then maybe look away and then do the reach without it? So how, how well am I integrating my vision and my motor? Um, auditory cues, we've talked a little bit about that. Um, are they using auditory cues and how? And then of course, strategic competence. So what skills have they developed? This would be the a strategic competence would be an example of Emma pulling her um, low tech key ring into the part of her vision that was strongest. And, you know, sometimes we will see the, oh, the visual field is high and it's to the left, like you were like, or to the right, I think was what you're just modeling. And then they say, mm, but we want them to be at midline. So we're going to put the device at midline so that they, we, we can work on the visual field of midline. So talk to me about when are we using the device for communication and when are we using the device as more of a, um, visual test or a visual um, visual rehab or visual therapy. And, and, and we, we need to know the difference between when we're doing, when we're trying to increase a visual field and when we're trying to get a reliable communication. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think I have the answer to that, but <laughs> I, I, I do know that there is a difference between um promoting functional communication and promoting the development of vision. And we may do those simultaneously, but I think that's hard. I think we have to be mindful about what we're doing. If you put that AAC at midnight, midline and they simply cannot see it, they will not use it functionally for communication. Mm -hmm. So whether you're shaping towards that or whether you're doing 
preferred activities in the midline mm-hmm. rather than so the communication stays up in the in the field but you're doing you're bringing some activities into midline so that the person can develop some strategic competence while also um, pr- developing their vision i what walker and wegner had a great article they were looking actually at you at training vision for eye eye gaze access um, but the eye gaze behaviors and that eye gaze for access for communication are slightly different. And they actually did a two step. So they first developed the gaze behaviors used that they d- demonstrated how that could then transfer over to functional communication. I think we need to be mindful that when you try to do two things at once, mm-hmm. sometimes it's successful, but oftentimes it's just, it's not. Right. And I think you make a really good practical option, you know, option there. It's like, if we are working on increasing the visual field at midline, don't do it with communication, do it with a preferred item, do it with, do it with something other than that. If communication is hard and vision is hard or positioning is hard or all three is hard, don't combine them all. What am I measuring when I'm putting it here within their visual field? And what am I working on when I'm not, right? Right. Um, so just to keep going through the, the paper, um, the responsibility of the communication partner, we talked about managing environmental complexity. So if you have someone who doesn't seem to be attending, is it because, and actually Emma's story includes this, when she was placed in a room and in the room she was placed by the window that overlooked the playground, all of those kids running around out there, all of that motion was very distracting and noise was very distracting. So let's take a look at the environment and see what are the kinds of things that are happening there that we might need to manage. Um, We've talked about placement in the visual field, um, the distance from the individual. So, you know, how far or near is the AAC device and what's optimal for that individual's visual functioning at the moment. Um, Movement we know is something that is quite powerful for everyone. And that also includes people with um, cortical visual impairment. So using, and I would say most savvy educators do this um, already. And I think Sarah Blackstone's got some some research that suggests that, but using motion to help cue attention um, and providing wait time, obviously. And so partners don't always do these kinds of things, but um, I think they're really important for us to kind of be, when you sort of got check, be checking what are we doing that's either promoting or maybe inhibiting this mm-hmm. child communicating effectively. So that's partner related. Krista, in regards to the environment, I think um, we work with a lot of students in schools. And so that can be a hard one because their classroom environment is very busy, perhaps noisy, And it's not always practical to pick someone from that environment to work on communication, right? What what do you think about that? Yeah, so, I mean, my my primary experience with this has been the bridge school. And the bridge school has taken a whole school method um, to this. So it's really, there's a lot of kind of universal design going on. So, And this may not be able to happen in a public school, but kind of let's take a look at the walls and are all of these things necessary in this classroom? Or is there a wall towards which we could face the person with CVI so that that wall is um, maybe not filled with, you know, all of the animals of the alphabet? So, and I'm not really the person to speak to on this, but my impression um, is that if you can do it as a universal design, it might benefit everybody, whether or not they have CVI. Yeah, great, great suggestion. Good point. Tell us more, tell us more. Okay, so the last part of the, um, that we talk about in this framework is uh, the design choices for the AAC. Um, And so we've already talked about this, kind of taking a look at the complexity within the symbol. Um, So how, how many items are within the symbol, or if it's a single meaning symbol, like a board maker symbol, how many keystrokes are are there? Um, The number of symbols on the display, we talk about this a lot, but you know, two, five, if you have 62, the child's probably not going to use it if their visual functioning isn't ready um, for that. It will be ready because we know it will progress. But if we start with the 62, it's, you know, if we make something really, really hard off the bat, it's not a shock that the person doesn't actually adopt it, right? It's like going to a website that's complicated and hard to use. You're going to go somewhere else uh, and use a a different method. Um, So, Uh, the familiarity of the symbols. So Lynn was very careful to use symbols that were either familiar looking. So it was, it was Emma's own 
you know, refrigerator, um, or symbols whose meanings were already familiar. And How do you do that with abstract words? So that's a really good question. And um, it's probably a better question for Lynn. Abstract words are hard in general. They must be learned. I would argue that for many people, um, you know, the bird maker symbols are not as transparent to many individuals as they seem to be to speech pathologists. So we think they're, they're you know, easy, they're, they're transparent, but they're not. But when we're talking about symbols for things that themselves can't be pictured, like justice, you know, we have to, we're going to have to learn that, whether it's a written word, whether it's an icon like, you know, the scales. Um, so I think there are, we just have to understand there are some things that are abstract. I think Lynn's approach with Emma, and I would say I would agree with this approach, was beginning, the first thing you have to learn is, why should I use this thing, right? And we're not going to start with concepts like justice. We're going to start with concepts like my favorite brush. And then once the understanding is in there, then we can start to introduce those important verbs are very important, right? For language development, abstract concepts are very important. Um, you know, snack looks differently across different cultures. So that even, even though it's, it's referring to something concrete, the way we're gonna represent it might vary depending on the person's cultural uh, background and heritage. So I think we have maybe done a little disservice um, in terms of trying to remember, like, what are we trying to get them to understand about AAC? Like, I have power over my communication partners, and that's a good thing, versus how are we representing things, and which is a slightly different question. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, so familiarity, and you're absolutely not all things are going to be familiar. I think once you get them up, and uh, my understanding from Lynn is once Emma was up and running with the familiar ones, then she was able to, you know, rapidly expand her vocabulary. We see a lot of this, people seem to understand the symbol background and foreground. So what color the background, what color the foreground, you know, the, the use of um, things like uh, the Roman bubble, which is around written words to help identify the shape of the word a little bit better. Um, color, oftentimes folks with CBI as well as folks without CBI have favorite colors. Can we harness that? Um, and internal symbol movement. And this is a hard one because the more movement you have on a symbol, within a symbol, the more complex that symbol is going to be. So a still of a foot near a ball is less complex than the actual foot kicking the ball. But that complexity, since it's supporting comprehension, might be important because it'll attract attention and it'll support that it's not the foot or the ball being referenced, it's the kick, right? Which is hard to visualize. So kind of, again, a mindful approach to can they handle movement within symbols? And if so, what is the benefit of having that um, additional? Um, we had symbol arrangement relative to one another. This is actually where we started. Lynn was showing um, Emma's AAC and she at the time had five symbols and those five symbols were arranged in the corners. So oftentimes we see these symmetrical row column grids and the symbols are kind of close to one another and there's nothing distinguishing the symbols other than oftentimes background color, which is a whole separate topic. So my research had suggested that more powerful than background color was clustering the symbols. So, uh, and I actually had done a study where I, I had four symbols in the upper right corner, four symbols in the upper left corner, four symbols in the lower right corner and four symbols in the lower left corner. Very powerful way to facilitate visual attention, efficient visual attention. That's exactly the arrangement that Lynn had for Emma, although she only had one symbol in each corner, but she was using that same spatial arrangement. That's kind of what got us started of, you're already doing this, this stuff that my research would suggest is, is the right way to do it. So, um, so symbol arrangement, um, backlighting, and um, navigation. So the navigation is, is kind of, can we use swipe? can we use these other ways of, of navigating that don't take up valuable real estate? I think the symbol arrangement is really interesting topic because um, I think sometimes we get a little nervous to modify something too much, right? Because we know there's a lot of thought behind why an AAC system is presented the way it is in the beginning. And um, I know that at one of the AAC by the way conferences, that concept came up of like the four, maybe it was something you presented the four or the checkerboard pattern. I know Brenda does that a lot um, with students and I've learned a lot from her that way. Um, so I think some of these things that once you start doing it and seeing it, it becomes 
it makes a lot of sense. But I think it's nice for us as SLPs to hear that there are different options for that symbol layout. Yeah, and I also have to say, we kind of have to remember where I started um, in this podcast, which is there's a lot of people for whom it doesn't matter if they're a symmetrical row column grid or if they were arranged on the corner. So there are some people for whom those symmetrical row column grids are perfectly well within kind of their worldview. It's the people for whom it's not working that we have to figure out, okay, what else can we do um, mm -hmm. to simplify this display for them? So um, I'm not by any means saying we should never have symmetrical row column grids, but I think when that person is not succeeding with that, we have to wonder why, and is there something else we can do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things that I wanted to touch on was this idea of a robust vocabulary. Um, within the field, we know that robust vocabulary um, as a concept is making sure that the person who uses AAC has access to a large number of vocabulary items, that um, the vocabulary items represent different kinds of words, um, that it allows for different types of communicative functions, um, and it can support the emergence of grammar. A robust vocabulary in AAC is typically realized by placing as many symbols as possible on a page, for instance, grids of 64 or 120 symbols. And this works for many people, but kind of part of my theme of it may be too complex, either visually or motorically for people who have visual processing or motor difficulties. Um, the analogy I would use is if um, we took a 120 symbol grid and we, and we reduced the size of the device so that the symbols themselves were only like an eighth of an inch wide or square, we probably wouldn't be able to distinguish them either visually if there was 120 little teeny weeny things or be able to respond to it accurately using our finger. And so I feel like that's a good analogy for this idea that there are some people for whom those larger grid, the, the more numerous uh, symbols on a grid is simply gonna um, not be feasible, at least in the short term. And in that case, we may have a lot of vocabulary on the on the display, but it's not the, the display is not a robust vocabulary because that person does not in fact have access to all of those items if they can't see them or if they can't touch them accurately. So I go back to the question for those folks for whom these busy grids are not yet a useful tool, is there another way to provide a robust vocabulary? Um, and that's the brilliance, I think, uh, one of many, of Emma's system, because the principle of the robust vocabulary is not about the layout of the system, lots of symbols on a page, it's about the access, the opportunities that the system gives them access to, lots of, lots of words of different types, um, ability to do grammar, ability to do different functions. So if you read our paper, you're gonna see very, two very brief descriptions of some of Emma's communication. Um, and even as brief as those descriptions are, they illustrate a wide range of vocabulary types and functions, um, making it clear that a Emma has access to and uses a variety of different kinds of words. Um, for instance, she, and for a variety of functions. So she has um, environmental control. So she does commands to Alexa, so that Alexa will do some environmental controls for her. Um, she uses a generated verb, noun, social regulatory sentence for a request. So I want grapes, please, is described in there. She answers a question about her feeling in the second vignette at the end when she says, good job, I like it. Um, and she describes her emotions, uh, happy, in the, also in that same vignette. So I think she also has access to a variety of conjugates. Um, that's something she's still learning, but they are available on her system. So even though her system is one that's kind of horizontal where she swipes through it and there's only five symbols per page, it still gives her access to this large, uh, diverse and um, potential grammar uh, that is necessary for it. So I think we need, as a field, need to kind of really be thinking about how can we offer robust vocabulary even when someone can't have, visually see all of those symbols. Yes. And one other thing I wanted to, to um, talk about one of the things that I've studied over the years um, with some of my former students, Shannon Hennig, um, Jen Thistle is a former student who's gone into this in some detail as well. Um, Barry Wegner has done work on working memory and the working memory demands that we see in AAC. Um, I thought a lot about, since I come from the area of kind of cognitive 
science and cognitive neuroscience have thought a lot about attention and memory and the attention and memory demands that we see in AAC. Um, and they're actually fairly, um, there's a lot of working memory demands in AAC, both related to the um, need to go through in your typical AAC, kind of a hierarchical tree structure. So I start on my main page and then I go to my food page and then I go to my snack page. Um, and then I have to navigate back uh, to the main page. Um, there's attention demands, there's memory demands, and it's slow. Um, I think that Emma's system has different, work, potentially different memory demands. I don't know. We haven't studied that yet. What I'm not sure is whether or not the memory demands for Emma's system are similar or different from the memory demands from a more traditional AAC system. I don't see any theoretical reason why they would be different. You're still having to do uh, keep things in mind while you swipe through other uh, potentially distracting items. Um, but I think that's something that really needs to be studied empirically. We need to actually look at what are the work. Just as we have for the traditional AAC, we need to look at the working memory demands of uh, Emma's type of AAC. Um, but I don't. I'm not really convinced that there's a um, a systematic reason why we would think that it would be different. Mm -hmm. So what resources would you, other resources would you tell people about to look into or what's out there besides the article, which which we will link to your podcast for sure? I think the Bridge School, it to me is the clearinghouse uh, for a lot of this because they have webinars available uh, that you can sign up for. They have resources on their website. Um, so to some extent, you know, it is connected to an individual school, but they basically have a clearinghouse. You can, you, like they have, our articles are, are up on their website, links to our articles are up on their website. So it's not just stuff that the Bridge School has produced, but it's also just other resources. So um, that's my go-to. Um, I know that the National Institutes of Health now has, the National Eye Institute has an initiative that includes CVI. So I would assume that that's going to be a clearinghouse for evidence-based practices and new good good and new ideas. So that I don't think is up yet, but I would look for that in the near future. Mm -hmm. Good right. to know. So Krista, thank you so much for joining us. You've talked about so many things that I think our listeners are evidence-based practice and keeping family and experiences um, in a part of that triangle that we know it is important. Um, You've talked about uh, your journey with Emma and Lynn and the considerations that came for that for AAC and CVI and when things are not working for students, what, what are some things we might that are not because of the student, but because of things that we need. And then um, that really interesting new research with AI and, and gestures. And um, we will look forward to hearing more about that. So thank you so much for joining us. We've, we've learned a lot today. Yes, thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. The contents of this podcast were developed under contract with the Washington Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction, U.S. Department of Education, and administered by Central Washington University. However, those contents did not necessarily represent the policy of the OSPI and CWU, and you should not assume endorsement by the federal and state government.